very much. I think the introduction was almost as long as my speech. Um, that probably says it all, actually. That was the whole, that was the whole story in one. Um, now, in your um, pamphlets there, um, you'll see a photograph of me with a, with a fairly large beard. I apologize, it's all gone. They sort of come and go every time I go away somewhere, if I grow a beard because I'm lazy and I don't shave, and then I come back and my daughter says, it's got to go, Daddy, or you don't get any kisses. So that's what happened that time. In fact, I'd just come out of China and Tibet uh, researching that, that book that um, Andrew just mentioned, and, uh, which was um, you know, a fascinating tale in itself. But another story, it's, the book is halfway through. It's going to be great. When I finish it, it'll get published, I hope, if the publisher thinks it's any good. Um, incidentally, as you said, that, 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 that whole journey, I think you said anyway, was about the search for Chairman Mao's lost son. How careless of him to lose a child. Isn't that, sort of strikes me as sort of interesting. But anyway, that's, as I say, another story. Talking about children, though, um, the ones that fascinate me the most, not just my own, are the ones who have these fantastic imaginations. And Ted is all about a celebration of imagination, as you know. And uh, the ability to sort of um, sit on their own, for example, and just have an imaginary friend just there, just to play with. And I think I'm talking about young children. I don't know any teenagers who do that anymore. If they do, there's probably some help needed. But, you know, an imaginary friend just to play with. I think that's great. Just make it up. They're actually real. They walk and they talk and they do everything that they're supposed to do, as good friends are. And they, and they never sort of cheat or lie or anything. It's a perfect little world. And they might even have an imaginary horse. My daughter had one. I was going to bring it up on stage, but I've decided to leave it outside grazing. Um, but I think that's when I was young, when I was six, growing up in Australia, I remember telling my teacher that we were building a boat, or well, my father was building a boat in our backyard. And um, every week I would give progress updates on how it was going. I remember it was very smooth. Very, my, my father was a brilliant boat builder, apparently, and the mast had a bit of trouble getting it up the driveway, but it, it happened, and, and the whole class was just sort of in, rap, in rapture about the whole you know, saga. And um, until my, my mother met my teacher in the supermarket or something, and uh, the teacher came up and said, how's it going? When are you off? Because building the boat was, of course, we were, I'd already said, we were going to sail around the world. That was the whole point. That's why you build boats in the outback of, pretty much the outback of Australia. You're trying to escape. <laughs> I'd never even seen the sea. Nor had my father, actually. <laughs> he, was a, he was a bank manager. <laughs> um, so imagine her surprise, my mother's surprise. I don't know which is greater. My mother's surprise at being told the story or my teacher's disappointment because she was, you know, wanting to believe. And we all want to believe in these great stories. Um, so anyway, that whole thing, I suppose, of, of childhood imagination is, is what, a little bit what I'm talking about today, as well as Afghanistan. Um, I, I do blame a little bit of this all on my mother, because she brought us up on a diet of Rudyard Kipling, um, this man here. And if you know, I'm sure you do, Rudyard Kipling, famous for how the leopard got his spots, for example, those just so stories, which we just dined out on as children. And for me, it was much more than that. I mean, I, I believed them. I thought how the leopard got his spots was actually lifted straight out of the National Geographic. It was fact. And the, and the great story of how the, how the elephant got his trunk was a, was a real a gripping account of the tussle between the elephant and the cro crocodile on the on the green and greasy banks of the Limpopo River. I was mortified when I grew up and they taught me about evolution. Um, Darwin. And um, actually, it was probably here. I went to school here. Um, somewhere on these walls here in the honor boards, you won't find me. <laughs> well, not even over there. I looked. Nowhere. Why don't they have one for the second sports teams? You know, it's always the first 15s and the first 11s. It's not what those try-hard people in the second 11s. You know, who yeah, nearly made it. Who were probably there's probably heaps of you out there. Right? You know, third 11s. Yes, go. Why doesn't the world honour these people? Um, where was I? Anyway, 
Darwin ruined my party because I realized that, of course, the evidence was starting to support the theory that Darwin was right and Kipling was wrong. The, of course, the evolution of the, of the, the uh, elephant's great snout, um, thousands of years of natural selection, etc. However, I didn't give up hope that I thought in one day that I would, or that in the world there existed some kind of magic still, because I think that's what really captured me. You know, the world was growing up in Sydney and in, and in New Zealand where I came when I was eight. Um, it was, you know, it, it was all out there, and I think you, as you know, New Zealanders, or, or we all live in this island, we know that there's something far greater off, off the shore. And see so many hands say, uh, you know, we've, we speak many languages and we've been to far fun places like North Korea, even if it was on a package tour, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, you know, it, it is, it is, it is a fantastic thing. So I was consumed by that. I wanted to find something uh, more in the world. And, um, and of course, I have this theory that as soon as you start looking for something, it starts looking for you. Like attracts like. Um, so that is how, in effect, I ended up in the back of a Russian troop carrier, a captured one, driven by some mad Afghan fighters, um, crossing the border from Iran into Afghanistan in the, in the dead of night. There was no border as such. We just went over the mountains and tried to avoid the border police, the Pazdaran, who were the religious police, if you like. And um, with about 40 or so Mujahideen from Hezbollah. Actually, a friend of mine said, or a friend of my sister's, when she told her that I had gone into Afghanistan with 50 Mujahideen, the friend had said, how much is that? <laughs> well, I always thought that was nice. <laughs> like, loads of money. <laughs> it's a party over there, you need money. No. Um, and that, and, and, and of course, you know, I mean, you can imagine, for me, and I'll, I'll get into how I got there in a, in, a, in a second, but everything changed after that. I mean, that first night, clinging onto the raw iron edges of a truck with no canopy on the top that was roaring and hissing and crashing its way across the desert, going up riverbeds to be, to be concealed for hours and hours and hours. because It was a horrendous journey. My hands were cut and bleeding just from hanging onto the sides. And I was also responsible for sitting on top of some artillery shells, which I was really hoping wouldn't go off, because there was enough explosives and everything, and guns and bullets in this truck with the other guys, um, you know, to make a very large hole in the ground. And that truck was that. So you can see the, um, the kind of road that you would find. This is actually now into Afghanistan. It's the day after. But there was none of that. This is now a sort of smooth, you know, smoothish kind of motorway compared to where we were the night before. And heading for those mountains into which um, sort of lead, or to the right actually, start to lead to the city of Herat. Um, now, Hezbollah, <laughs> everyone goes, ooh, hostage takers of Lebanon. And it's understandable, really, because I mean, they've got such a bad rap. Um, and deservedly so. I mean, I don't think. I think it was John McCartney who was held hostage by Hezbollah in, in Lebanon for God knows how long, for most of, his, most of the 80s, I think. But the Hezbollah, Hezbollah I was with, of course, was nothing to do with that. Same religion, same Shiite Muslim, but quite different. And um, I suppose I'm here to, to just you know, to tell you that. <laughs> Not that you're probably going to meet anyone from Hezbollah, I don't think, in the, in the near future, but if you do, you can trust them to a certain extent. I think. <laughs> um, they're a good bunch of guys. How I got there, very briefly, because I've only got 11 minutes left. My father brought home a story, and as I said, he was in Australia and a bank manager, and he brought home this story to us uh, of an Afghan he had met. That's why there are camels in Australia. They were brought there by the Afghans who came to help build the railways. And, um, and I thought it was a fantastic story, this, this tall man with a nut-brown skin and blue eyes and his laundry on his head, as he described it, the turban. And, uh, and, it, and it was just a story that grew up with us as children, and me particularly, and then, unfortunately, when I was 13, my father suddenly died. And shortly after that, the Russians invaded Afghanistan. And if you can imagine a 13-year-old boy, he just lost his father, he just doesn't go, oh, yeah, I, I get it. Oh, life, death, I get it, I understand. I didn't, I just go, no, not having it. So somewhere in my mind, I placed my father elsewhere, and the only obvious place I could think where he would go would be Afghanistan, to find the Afghan. 
So I knew that somewhere, at some stage, I would end up there looking for him. Of course, many years go by and you grow up as adults and you go to work and I was in London and then I had a job at an, a, an, a, an advertising agency, blah, 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 doesn't matter. <laughs> advertising. Um, and I got made redundant. And I thought, yes, you get a check. See you later, Richard. I got a one-way ticket to Istanbul. The next minute I started walking. Turkey, Iraq. I, Iran, Iran had closed down because Salman Rushdie had had his fatwa slept on him. Um, if you remember, so the border closed down, but I said, stop that, I'm going anyway. Um, so I, I made friends with some Kurdish smugglers who got me away in. I faked my passport, got a visa, forged some things on it that allowed me to go through, and a small a mountain border post way down by Iraq where no one was really looking. And it was only, a, only had a one-week transit visa, a, a pilgrim visa, the only, the only kind you could get. And, um, I stayed three months in Iran looking for the Hezbollah. Sort of randomly, kind of wandering around a little bit. But um, when I found them and they agreed to take me in, it was the beginning of all of this. And I changed, um, as you would expect. Uh, but not just in a, in, a, um, <laughs> in a way that I was growing a beard. I had been traveling for eight months or something, so it was fairly bushy. I fitted right in with these guys. Um, they gave me a new name, Masud, and uh, it was given to me by a guy who became a close friend, Nebi. His family name he generously gave to me, Mohandaspor. So suddenly I'm a, this new person. I've taken all my old clothes and chucked them away. I've had I bought in the market some shawar kameez, the shirt, the big baggy trousers. I had my walking boots on, that was about all, and a bag with a camera and some film. And and a turban, of course. I didn't bring one with me. Richard said, well, are you gonna show them how to tie a turban? I mean, isn't that the point? That's what it's all about. And I said, no, it's not about how to tie it. It's, most women here would know how to tie a turban. If you, you know, kind of, maybe it's a towel or something or a scarf that you keep your hair right, but you know, a turban is the same thing. Anyway, cut that long story. Um, seven minutes, 40 seconds. <gasps> Where were we? Let's get moving. Um, 1989, this is actually the year 1410. Quite good for my age. 1410, the Islamic calendar, of course, started with a walk from, to uh, Muhammad made to Medina. I think it's, it occurred to me uh, the other day, what a great way to start a religion, have a walk. <laughs> I mean, I know ours is quite, you know, Christianity is quite nice, the birth of a child and everything like that, but a walk, I mean, that's, what, that's more me. <laughs> I will go for a walk, I'll start a religion. Um, 1989 was, of course, the death of uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. I happened to be in Tehran at the time. That's a photograph, just one of my favorite ones, actually. And in the background, you can see the Paz Dharan, the religious police, the mean guys of Iran, um, all up on top of the podium where his funeral, where his body was in a refrigerated box, which is something else <laughs> in, in that intense heat. And gathered around there are at least half a million people in black and, and me in a yellow and black plaid shirt. That's all I had. That was, you know, prior to meeting Hezbollah. I was actually arrested and, and stuck in jail for a day and then deported, but I managed to escape my, my deportation by getting off the train that was, ta was supposed to take me to Pakistan and run away into a bus, go back to Mashhad, where I, where I eventually found Hezbollah. And Mashhad is a city, the holy city of Mashhad, near Afghanistan. <sighs> Are you keeping with me? <laughs> Um, it, was all the, it was also the coming down of the wall in Berlin and of Tiananmen Square. It's an incredible time, um, particularly for me. So Hezbollah took me in, gave me my new name. The religion, the aspects of the religion started to consume me. I mean, five times a day they would be up at prayer. This is in the middle of a desert or somewhere like that. I would, while they're looking west, I'm looking east to the rising sun, and uh, I wouldn't pray with them. That would be wrong. I knew how to. If I could fake it, I, I could, but I knew that was wrong to even attempt to, and quite, you know, would get me into serious trouble if I pretended to be a Muslim. But they didn't want me to be that. They wanted me to be who I was, a believer, yes, in one God. They would always ask me, do you believe in one God? And I would say, Fagat Yehoda, meaning there was only one, because the worship, you know, in Islam, to worship many gods is wrong. So I, I managed to make, to not make that big mistake. That would have been 
very, very bad. Because even though the Hezbollah guys were really nice, they didn't sort of like it if you step too far out of line. And, um, and I suppose that's only, that's only human nature. Their tolerance of me was, was, uh, was exceptional. I mean, they fed me and watered me, and I walked with them for many, 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 many miles, and we got to know each other very well. Herat, um, oh, that, that was me. Uh, so that's how I looked. The, the waistcoat is, is amazing. It's got 17 pockets in it. It's, a, it's sort of enough to carry all your weapons and anything you wanted. I didn't, of course. I had a notebook. Um, because they thought I was a BBC journalist, so I always carried, I made notes. Um, <laughs> going on another walk. <laughs> um, and that is the main street heading into Herat City, which is quite a large city even now. It's re relatively large. And as you can see, completely bombed by the carpet bombing in the, you know, the Russians in the beginning of the war. All the, all the brush that's grown up. It's, it's pretty much exactly the same now, because I've been back except for all the brush and all the houses, all the buildings that are bombed out are now sort of starting to come back together and there are shops and people selling things and cars and trucks going this way and that. But for us, we couldn't go past those trees. That was a minefield, there you got shot. And in fact, you got shot at most days. These guys on a motorbike are just crossing from one side to the other quickly and I'm taking a photograph of them very, very quickly because there were snipers everywhere. And we lived in these buildings. Um, I won't go, I'm running out of time a little bit, so I think I'm going to keep going, but they, one of the, they'd make homes in these built, bombed out buildings, and then one we lived was called Paris, and it was a dump. The other side of the building was called Kuwait, it had water, and that was sort of the best one. Strange how they saw Kuwait better than Paris, I don't know. Um, and prayer, you know, again, was a daily thing. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, if you've ever woken up to the call for prayer you know, at dawn, it's, it still sends a shiver up my spine. Um, I don't get the same thing out of the clanging of bells down at the St. Andrews, funny enough. Um, but eventually I had to leave Herat for my own sanity, I think, because I was starting to go a little bit crazy. Uh, war is <laughs> like that. And I started walking. And as Andrew said, it's a long way. I don't, I don't even know how long, 700, maybe 1,000. You go up, down, up, down, up, down. Mountains, mountains, desert, desert, mountains. You, you get very, very, very fit. And, um, and I walked with people who showed me the way each time, like another village, another village. Interesting, that guy was carrying my bag. I don't know if you can see that very well, but he you know, insisted I, I, he would do everything. This is the natural Afghan spirit. And I just met him. Well, our paths had converged. Yes, he's carrying a gun. <laughs> But our paths would converge, and he would have this long greeting. It's the wonderful thing about Afghans. They go on and on and on before they actually ask you any particular question, because you've got news. You're a newspaper. You've just come from over the valley. How is Hajkari Ahmad Ali? Did you see him, the great famous commander? You know, I'd just been with him, so I could tell him that the war was going very well. We were winning. You know, the Russians were on the way out, which is true. And, um, and, and you know, these greetings are wonderful. Um, we just sort of say, hello. G'day, you know, we don't really, I think maybe we've got too many friends, we don't need any more. Facebook is, we just collect them en masse and you know, we've, our lives are full. But for an Afghan, it's, it's you are everything. Um, I was even, <laughs> I was even given a, uh, given a wife. <laughs> That's not her. <laughs> That's the goat that came with the wife. My real wife, my real wife is over there. She's, uh, no, I'm glad, I, all these things, experiences you, you go through, uh, and thankfully survive. I said no, by the way. I said no, thank you. <laughs> I'm walking again. <laughs> um, another couple of guys that I met, for example, a camel with a, with a motorbike on its, on its back. It's brilliant. <laughs> Taking the motorbike to get fixed, you know. <laughs> And, and a couple of likely lads, you know, you, you probably look at a photograph like that now and say, oh, well, here's Taliban, you know, that's probably uh, Al-Qaeda or something, but it's not, it's just two guys, you know, normal Afghans going about their lives, naturally carrying guns because everyone did, and they were very proud of them. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a long way from the, what the media tell you about Afghanistan or Afghans. Um, the, the last thing, I think, because I'm really running out of time and I can't be up here all day, 
um, is that I did eventually walk and get to Pakistan. And as you said, I crept across the border to Pakistan. Again, no visa, straight, you know, just walk across. I got deported up into China, started traveling for another six months before I got back to a typewriter or a keyboard, and I wrote a book. And when the book was published, many years after having writ being written, there were a lot of media hype, and, and people said, Why, what happened to your friends? This is a, you know, now 10 years ago. What happened to your Hezbollah friends? I, I have no idea. I have, I, I have no answer for you. They're, they're Nebi, they're, they're all the others, they're just, they had no telephone numbers, no address books. They'd never been to school, or they'd, I didn't even know where they lived. We just were together. And so I resolved to go back, and which I did, and, and this whole needle in the haystack story was told in the second book called Looking for the Afghan. And a successful story it was, unbelievably, is that you know, if you decide to do something, you know, I said, you decide to do something, it starts looking for you. Well, I don't think I found Nebi. It's mysteriously, Nebi found me. I just happened to be in the right place for him to do that, because word got out that I was back. I think I had a bit of a reputation. And that, but they'd remembered me, this strange foreigner from the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> um, but on... The last thing I will say was that the, um, on the eve of going back to Afghanistan the second time, and this is a, couple of year, a few years ago now, my children were much smaller, and I, it, it was at night time. I was going to catch a, a, a train, uh, sorry, a plane to Tehran indirectly, sort of, and I was leaving at four in the morning. So I sat there outside their rooms, and I thought, what am I going to write? What if I don't come back? because it's, you know, it's still a pretty rough place. I decided I would write them a letter, say, you know, take care of yourselves. I decided I'd write them a story, because as well as being a global adventurer, <laughs> I'm a storyteller, a writer, and an author. And this is a story about something, this is like a how-to story, like a, a, a Kipling story. You probably know where wildflowers, or you think you know where wildflowers grow, or why they grow. They pop up here and there. I know different. I wrote this story about a little creature called a jingle bub with seven legs all in a row, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, with flowers growing out of its hair, and it's very fast, but it could never, ever stop, because if it ever stopped, as you can imagine, with seven legs all in a row, it would fall over. The great thing about a jingle bub is that when it does fall over, and of course they do stop, they go, oh, and they, they plant the flower in the ground. Wherever they happen to stop, that's where the flower is planted. And that, best beloved, is where, why wildflowers grow where they grow. Now you know. Now, that's my theory. You may think Darwin has another one, and you're quite welcome to take, pick up on his theory, but I thought I'd just leave you with that parting gift, is that there's possibility that may, he may not be right. <laughs> All right, look, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much.